Uh, good morning, everyone, here in, uh, in Zoom and uh, faith, Facebook. We thank you for joining us this morning for uh, service. And it's a beautiful day. It's a day that the Lord has made. And uh, we really are blessed here in Santa Barbara. And we're blessed that you uh, have come to join us to worship the Lord. So... Um, Normally, uh, today, um, someone else would, would have been uh, announcing, but you got stuck with me again. So, But anyway, thank you for coming. Um, maybe we can go to the announcements now. And well, they're on the uh, third page of your uh, bulletin. And um, we'll just start with number one. The uh, parking lot will be resurfaced, and it's uh, still tentatively scheduled for the 21st. So um, be prepared to that if you come to the church on the 21st. Um, there is a Mother's Day luncheon that we're planning for May 9th in the parking lot. Um, so um, that uh, luncheon is going to be sponsored by uh, Leo and his son, Tim. So all, all are welcome for that. And uh, Florence's uh, memorial service uh, will be held on June 5th. And then, of course, we have our list of prayer requests. And I did want to mention that uh, Pastor Derek is away this weekend. Uh, he's at his grand aunt's uh, birthday party. So uh, we pray that, you know, that would go well for them and be a lot of fun. And um, in addition to the list of people uh, for prayer, um, I have a couple of other prayer requests that have been submitted. Um, first, a praise report. Uh, Aaron, uh, Alexi's dad, came home from the hospital on Friday and is doing well and is in good spirits. So thank you for your prayers for him and uh, continue praying that, that he would recover well and uh, do well at home. And then um, Lily Reese's friend, Marlene, has uh, pancreatic cancer. So we want to lift up her up in prayer and um, commit her to the Lord. And then Craig is uh, sick, uh, probably with the flu, uh, but he is starting to feel better, but we should pray for Craig uh, to get completely well. Um, are there any other prayer requests or praises that you'd like to share? Anyone? Okay. Okay, so um, today's missionary that we're going to be praying for, or missionary group, is JAMS, the uh, Japanese Evangelical Mission Society. And um, they sponsor um, ACF uh, out at UCSB, and they sponsor um, a week of family camp and uh, uh, kids camps up at Mount Hermon every year. And they are starting that again this year. So um, it's something that uh, we really enjoy, and I encourage any of you who can make it to try to make it to GEMS. I'm not sure if actually there's still any openings, but if there are, it, I, I feel it's really worthwhile. So if you can do that, uh, I encourage you to attend that. Um, I guess that's it for announcements. If there's anybody else, no? Okay, so I think we can go to prayer now. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day and all the blessings you've given us this past week, Lord. We thank you again that we can come freely to worship you and that we can fellowship with each other here in our sanctuary, Lord and that we can 
spread your word over Zoom and Facebook, and I pray that you would bless all those listening online, Lord. We thank you for how you've watched over Bethany and uh, the people here, and we thank you also for watching over the country, Lord. Thank you for how you blessed uh, the United States, and we lift up all our leaders to you and pray that you would give them wisdom, Lord. As we uh, think of people that we want to pray for, we have many on our prayer list. We lift all them up to you, Lord. I especially think of Marlene, a new request that we just learned of today, that you would be with her, encourage her, give the doctors wisdom as they uh, treat her for the cancer, and that you could heal her, Lord. Thank you that we can come and pray to you for health or for whatever we need, Lord. I also want to lift up the uh, GEMS organization to you. Continue to uh, bless them and use them to glorify you and uh, spread your name, Lord. Uh, they've done a, a lot of good work, and we pray for them, Lord. I also want to lift up our tithes and offerings to you, Lord. I pray that you would bless them to glorify your name and that uh, you would bless the people giving, Lord. And even though it's a small part of what you have given us, Lord, we give it to you with thankful hearts, Lord. Thank you again for your blessings. I pray that you would bless the rest of this service, the music, the uh, preaching, uh, the fellowship afterward would all be to glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If the praise team could come up now, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and welcome, Bethany Church, and those of you online. And today we have Japanese service going on in Koinonia Room, so our numbers are a little smaller today. So you all have to sing with loud voices and lots of spirit. It's great to see you all. Today the uh, theme is Blessed Are the Persecuted. Uh, and these songs deal with uh, suffering and also persecution, but also how the Lord is victorious and all-powerful and will bring us the victory. So if you'd please stand and join us singing Blessed Be Your Name and then Our God. <clears throat> Shining down on me when the 
Seem loud or guitars okay? Oh, guess it's just my ears. Okay. <laughs> okay, next is our God. Our God is greater. Our God is all powerful. <clears throat> our God is stronger.
God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. God is empowered. Nothing can stand against us, even when we're in persecution. Our God is stronger. And there's great blessing in persecution as well. So we'll sing the blessing now.
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May His presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, He is for you, He is for you. Thank you. May your favor be upon each one here and on their children and their children's children. Lord, may you be with them in the morning and the evening. May you surround them and fill them with your joy and your peace because you are for them. You are for us. You are for each of us. And if you are for us, who can be against us? We thank you, Lord, for that promise in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. Oh, that was great. Isn't it awesome we have the Lord go before us? Today's uh, scripture read reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 16. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Bob. Whoa. 
can hear me, huh? <laughs> Had to get my pastorly jacket on, and uh, and my and my pastorly wife told me to get the get it straight, you know. And, uh, so it's again, it's good to be here um, today. I'm going to try using slides again, and that reminded me the church development team. You know, is meeting to discuss ways that we can improve our worship service and draw more people. And we want to we don't want to have a worship service that is meets your needs and lifts your worship experience. So one of the questions will be if you like more more video and slides or fewer videos and slides. And <clears throat> so please let us know. I'm continuing with the series that Derek and I have been going through with the uh, Celebrate Recovery. And the last step in AA is having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. And the Celebrate Recovery final step eight is Yield yourself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and my words. So the idea in the passage that was read there by Bob was that the persecution comes from being salt and light and from sharing your faith, sharing your testimony, you're going to meet opposition in the world. And that is where a lot of the persecution comes from. And so that's why this verse is tied in with these steps. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And another paraphrased translation says, you know, happy are those who are persecuted for doing the right thing, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Of all the Beatitudes, this one seems like the most difficult to understand. How in the world can it be a blessing to be persecuted? And to understand that, I think we first have to understand why Christians are persecuted and what are the types of persecution that we should expect. And then how does God want us to respond when we are persecuted? <clears throat> right now, I would say persecution in the U.S. is light compared to the rest of the world. And even though it seems light to us, we need to be prepared because at any time it could get more severe. And Jesus and Paul both said, if you get persecuted, do this and that. Uh, no, or they did not say, if you get persecuted, do this and that. They said, when, when you get persecuted, do this or that. Because it's not a matter of if, but it's just a matter of when we will get persecuted if we, were, if we are trying to share the gospel and stand up for what the Lord says. You can see that in, uh, sorry, in 2 Timothy, indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. <clears throat> that, that word that's translated persecute in the uh, New Testament, it's a Greek word, Dioko, which is um, also translated as pursue or chase after, or kind of like hunt down or hound something. And that's the idea of persecution, is you're going after someone and you're hunting them down. You want to prevent them from doing what they're doing. So I have just came up with some different types of persecution kind of made a scale. Uh, this is not, not uh, divine, but it's just my, my opinion and my study of what's in the word and what's going on in the world regarding persecution. But, uh, and these are listed in your insert, in your uh, bulletin, but the uh, 10, 10 types of persecution that I've seen happening in the Bible and in the world. The worst, of course, being being killed for your faith. And most of the apostles were killed for their faith. 
We see this uh, even today in Muslim nations and in North Korea. In Pakistan, if you, if you were to go out in the street and say that Jesus is superior to Muhammad, you would be jailed and probably executed for blasphemy. In North Korea, if you possess one verse of the Bible and you're found carrying one verse of the Bible, you'll be put in a concentration camp. And many Christians who are put in concentration camps end up dying of uh, sickness or starvation. And then there are these marauding bands of uh, Muslim extremists in Northern Africa that are raiding villages in Nigeria and other parts of North Africa. The uh, Open Doors USA uh, organization keeps track of um, martyrs and persecution around the world, and they have rated 50 countries as the worst countries for persecution, North Korea being the worst. But last year they tallied what they know of 4,761 Christians were killed for their faith in those 50 countries. And then the next one is torture. Torture is often used in North Korea and Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other Muslim countries. Their goal in torture is to get you to renounce your faith or to expose other Christians, especially the leaders of churches. And then the next one down is just being jailed and imprisoned. Now this is very common in China. Um, in those same 50 countries, they have, um, they're aware of at least 4,488 Christians who were arrested and imprisoned and 4,277 church buildings that were attacked this last year. And being, uh, being jailed in China, it's, it's a way that they hope to squash the expanding house church movement. And they jail the pastors, and they figure if the pastors are taken out of the picture, then uh, churches won't grow and they won't expand. But actually, the reverse is happening because God raises up more leaders, and the church gets purified through the persecution and I, I heard a, Jap or a Chinese pastor say one time that they really think of it as part of their training to be jailed. They don't think you're really, that you're not really a, a fully experienced, ordained pastor in China unless you've been jailed at least once because it's a time of testing. Uh, typically, they're, they're jailed for one, one to five years in China. <clears throat> then the next one would be being a refugee, and we see a lot of that this year. I mean, at this time, there are over 50 million, I think it's even closer to 60 million refugees in the world now, people who have had to flee their country. I just read that in Syria, 50% of the people have had to leave their homes in Syria because of the war. Um, so being a refugee, uh, sometimes it's because of war and sometimes it's because of persecution or sometimes it's just because of violence. Like in Central America, people are trying to escape violence and gang related activities. <clears throat> but Jesus said, um, in Matthew 10, 23, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will have not gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And in the book of Acts, if you read about Paul's missionary journeys, he often was threatened or stoned or just chased out of town. And many times he was persecuted and left and went to another town. And then they would come back later to check in on the disciples when things have cooled down. So it's not, uh, it's not a sin to flee uh, persecution. It's biblical. And it's also not a sin to stay and stand and possibly be martyred for your faith. Um, some, 
I know some missionaries and organizations really push for converts to stay in their countries and not flee, but I believe that, that, that it's not biblical to say that that's the only path. People need to choose whether they're going to flee to another area where they can share the gospel or whether they're going to stay and stand. And Chris Starr, the organization we used to work with, well, we still work with them part-time, but um, their policy was that if the leaders in Christar felt that things were getting too dangerous in an area, they would tell the missionaries, we recommend you leave. Or if the local people thought it was too dangerous, they could make the decision to leave. But they also had the option of deciding to stay even if the leaders said, we think you should leave. And we saw that take place in northern Iraq. We had friends in northern Iraq when ISIS was expanding. And the Kurdish army was telling them, don't worry, we will protect you. And so our missionaries actually stayed longer in northern Iraq than what our leadership thought they should. But eventually they left for a time, and then they came back. <clears throat> so I think each person has to decide between them and the Lord on whether to flee or whether to stay when there's persecution. Now, some of the things we see in America um, might lose the job. I've heard stories about men who have had to leave a place because they didn't want to do uh, deceptive type business or lying, lying to customers. And their boss would say, well, if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna keep up with the program, <clears throat> the way we like to do things, then we're gonna let you go. Or if Christians are found out and people confront them with issues of the day and, and they stand up for what they believe, they may get asked to leave. Um, but also we need to remember when we're on the job, we're not to be proselytizing and, and speaking out on issues on company time. And so we do need to uh, be careful about that and to be good workers, good testimonies in our jobs. But it is possible to lose your job because of your faith. And another thing that happens in America is lawsuits and fines. I remember reading about uh, Randy Alcorn, who's written some Christian novels, lives up in Washington State. And he was involved in protests on some abortion clinics. And they sued him, and he lost the lawsuit. And so they basically garnished all his income from his book sales. And so he, he formed a, a separate corporation for his books, books sales so that all the income from the books would just go to a charity because otherwise all that money was going to go to the abortion industry. And then another thing that happens in our country is public censure or ridicule, uh, trying to ruin your reputation. And I think of Tim Tebow. He endured a lot of harassment as a college and pro football player for standing up for his faith and even for just praying on the football field. And I, what I thought has been interesting is if you go to a football game in person, I've been to a few Ohio State games uh, in recent years. I've noticed that there's groups when they come out and practice before for the game, there's groups that pray together uh, in college and pro, but you will rarely see it on TV. They just won't show that on TV now, but, but they weren't able to stop people, uh, players from praying on the field and social media attacks, that's a big, big problem now with uh, uh, that type of persecution, especially if you, if you go on social media and say something um, negative about homosexual behavior, I mean, you can, you can be certain you're going to be attacked ferociously. Um, but in my, my humble opinion, um, it's really hypocritical for us to get on social media and, and attack one type of sin because we're all sinners, right? And um, there's Christians we know who are committing adultery or lying or 
uh, cheating on their taxes or gossiping and a multitude of different sins. And so on social media, we really need to focus on the gospel and just lifting up the Lord. And if you get persecuted for sharing the gospel and saying this is the only way to heaven, then that's, to me, that's true persecution. Um, and it's not our job to judge the world. You know, that's, that's God's job to judge the world. And so we need to be careful that we're not inviting unnecessary attacks. But another level is shun, being shunned by your family. And again, this is very common in uh, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist communities because they see becoming a Christian as basically turning your back on your family. And even in America, uh, I've met Jewish people who have been shunned by their families for becoming Christians. And of course we saw this in uh, Japan. We had a friend named Kumi and Mariko also knows her. I think Mariko was a roommate of hers at uh, Tokyo Christian. Well, when Kuni became a Christian and got baptized, her, her parents were extremely upset with her. And so when they found out she'd been baptized, when she would come home in Japan, when you come home, you say, Tadaima, which means I'm home, uh, there'd be silence. They would, not, they would not give the conventional greeting, welcome home. And at dinner, they wouldn't speak to her. And then when she would wash dishes with her mom afterwards, that used to be a time of fellowship with her mom and they'd talk about their days, but her mom wouldn't say a word to her. And this silent treatment went on for like six months and finally Kumi just couldn't handle it anymore and she moved out, got her own apartment. And it was years before her family opened up to her and, and began to communicate with her again. So being shunned by family is, is pretty common and it can happen in America as well. And also being shunned by neighbors, former friends. Um, when, you, when you become a believer, especially if, you're, if you were living a, a rather wild life like I was, um, sometimes your friends think you've lost your mind. Oh yeah, Chuck's got religion now. And, uh, and <laughs> Um, so I experienced that, but I learned through the, through the years that it's best to try and keep contacts with, with your former friends so that you can share the gospel with them and have an audience. But if the temptation, if there's too much temptation to fall back into that old lifestyle, then you have to balance, balance that. And sometimes when you're a young Christian, you need to pull away for a while but try not to break off those relationships completely. But that can be a form of mild persecution or ridicule. Um, so those are the uh, different forms of persecution, but why are we persecuted? Have you ever thought about that? Why, why do people persecute Christians when um, Christians are trying to help people. Christians are trying to live a good life. Why did people persecute Jesus? I mean, Jesus was the most perfect human being to walk the earth. He did good works. He healed people. He helped people that came to him. Why did they hate him? Well, I see uh, three, three main reasons that persecution exists. The first is it's a threat to governments. As, as I talked about before, some of these governments like China, Russia, Turkey, Vietnam, any authoritarian government is threatened by Christianity because Christians put God, obeying God higher than obeying the government. And in China now, um, China has kind of ebbed and flowed in how they uh, how they treat Christians and then things have opened up for a while and then things got tight and now things are getting tighter with President Xi and he is now pushing on churches to replace the cross and other artifacts in the church with pictures of him 
and uh, the government wants you to trust in the government rather than to trust in the Lord. And so they see Christianity as a threat, that people will be, become rebellious because they're trusting in the Lord rather than the government. And then it's a threat to national religions, uh, many Muslim countries that I mentioned before um, see Christianity as a threat, especially Iran and Afghanistan see it as a threat because Christianity is spreading in those countries. You don't read about it in the newspapers, but with satellite uh, TV going into these countries now and uh, missionaries, there's even former Al-Qaeda people who have become Christians and are secretly spreading the gospel in these countries and the government can't stand that. They see that as a threat. And the religious leaders are tied in with the government in these countries. So they see Islam as a national religion. And we see it also in India, where uh, the current, current leader in India sees Hinduism as the national religion. And he's persecuting Muslims and Christians to prevent them from gaining influence in India. Um, because they look at countries, you know, they might look at a country like South Korea. Well, that used to be a Buddhist country, and now it's, it's considered more of a Christian country. Over 30% of the people have become Christian in South Korea, and they don't want that to happen to their countries. <clears throat> and then I think the biggest reason is Christianity is a threat to people's pride. The idea there is um, think about why the Jewish leaders persecuted Jesus. They expected the Messiah to come in and, you know, praise them for how they were running the temple and to, to validate them and raise them up, you know, and tell the people, hey, these priests are doing a great job. But Jesus came in and criticized their man-made laws and then they criticized Jesus for healing people on the Sabbath, and he said, it's right to do good on the Sabbath. And when anybody challenges our beliefs and our behaviors, we get defensive, and that's what happened with the Jewish leaders and the priests. And we come under conviction for our sin, but we want to either deny it, cover it up, or make excuses. So when we do what um, Jesus tells us to do in Matthew 5, to be salt and light and to tell people that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone needs to trust in Jesus and believe that he is Lord and that he was raised from the dead. And that's the only way to receive forgiveness. When we tell people that, we're basically telling them, in your current state, you're not acceptable to God. And they're going to rebel against that. They're either going to rebel and make excuses and defend themselves or they're going to actually say, you're right, I need to repent, I need to ask God for forgiveness. <clears throat> but if people don't humble themselves, then they're going to fight. And when they fight, they're going to persecute the messenger. <clears throat> and of course, with all three of these, we need to remember that Satan's involved in all of these. And that's, that's another dimension of persecution, the spiritual warfare. Satan is active. Jesus said he's the ruler of this world. And Peter and Paul talk about that as well. Satan is still active. Satan is still setting people in positions of authority. And I know, I know that we talk about, you know, how God, God's the one that decides on who's going to be president. But I'm not sure that that is always the case because Satan has a lot of control over the kingdoms of the world. And he also is setting people up. When you look at some of the evil people who have become leaders around the world over history, you can see Satan's hand in so much of what takes place in governments. And he's also the mastermind behind false religions. Satan helps mankind to come up with these fake man-made religions. And 
Of course, Satan is involved when people are feeling attacked uh, by Christians with the gospel. <clears throat> um, when people get angry, you know, the Bible says, don't let your anger cause you to sin. And don't let the devil get a stronghold. When we get angry, Satan starts to get a stronghold. And then he turns that anger into hate. And that hate can get to the point of where you want to kill somebody. And that's what happened with the Jewish priests. I mean, how it just seems incomprehensible to me that a priest could be doing sacrifices and prayers every day and spending time in the temple. And then when the Messiah comes, he is so offended by the Messiah that he develops a hate to want to kill him. But that's how Satan works uh, subtly to bring persecution against Christians. So what are we to do? What should be our response? Well, I've come up with 10 things in the Bible that it teaches about our response to persecution. This is not an exhaustive uh, divine list either. These are just things that I've gleaned over the years. And the first two are not to be surprised. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So as Timothy or Paul said in 1 Timothy, you know, everyone who tries to live a godly life will be persecuted. So we shouldn't be surprised when we face persecution. And then love your enemies and pray for those and bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. And this is from Matthew 5:44 and uh, Romans 12:14. And Romans 12:14 says bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. So the idea is it's not a uh, it's not that we have to have this emotional attachment for them, but we are to do good for them, for our enemies and those who persecute us. And it's okay, as I said, to flee to another area when we're persecuted. Uh, you may need to do that to protect your family. Uh, so don't consider it a failure if you leave an area of persecution. I mean, things in California could, could really go bad someday, and maybe you'd want to go to another state or uh, to Canada or something to escape persecution. And then um, rejoice and be glad is what's written in Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when others revile you, and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And 1 Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So he wants us to keep an eternal perspective, and I'll get into that a little more of um, the blessings of persecution. But when you think about that, think how much honor prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Moses are going to receive in heaven. If you suffer severe persecution and you stand strong in your faith, the Lord is also going to praise you along with the prophets in heaven and give you that crown of life. And number five is remember that you are blessed. In 1 Peter 4, 14, it says, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of God or the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. In other words, it's, it's proof that God's spirit is with you and on you and it's kind of like that seal of assurance. The Holy Spirit is with you, and you are God's child. 
So you have that assurance when you're, when you're persecuted that you are God's child and his spirit is in you. And do not be ashamed, but rather glorify God in the name of Jesus. That's in 1 Peter 4, 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And so it's a great testimony if we're persecuted to humble ourselves and just not try to defend ourselves, but just defend the Lord and give glory to the Lord. And then entrust your soul to a faithful creator. This again is from 1 Peter 4. And um, I went back and forth on whether I should preach from 1 Peter 4 or Matthew 5. <laughs> But um, a lot of good teaching in 1 Peter 4. And verse 19, the first part of verse 19 says, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And so we're encouraged to keep doing good, which is also number eight, persevere and continue doing good. But trust that the Lord has got it in control. The songs we sang today, you know, he is for us, so who can be against us? And the, our God is greater, our God is stronger. We have to keep that continually in mind. And persevering, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 12 says, And we labor, working with our own hands. When we, when we are reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. And verse 9 we're persecuted but not forsaken. Uh, this is 2 Corinthians 4. Persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. So we don't give up. We don't give up on the Lord because we know that he will help us endure. And then preach the word in season and out of season and be ready to explain why you have hope even in the midst of persecution. 1 Peter 3, 15 to 17 is up here, says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will, then for doing evil. And finally, if you're really being persecuted and you're put into a position like you're being arrested or you're just being put on, on trial in front of a group, um, trust that the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Jesus said in Matthew 10, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it's not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. And one, one commentator that I read on this passage says, but don't use this for an excuse to not bother reading the Bible anymore. You know, oh, the Holy Spirit will tell me what to say when the time comes. Um, no, we're supposed to be preparing ourselves and thinking about what kind of questions are people going to ask me when I say this and be prepared to share. But if you're all of a sudden thrown into a situation and you're, you're being attacked, um, trust that God will give you the words to say. And so in summary, um, I want to end with the blessings of persecution, but some of the some of the blessings in this life that I don't have time is really another message. But you know, when we're persecuted, the church is actually strengthened, and one reason is because false Christians are not going to hang around if if the church is being persecuted. It will clear them out, and the church becomes pure and stronger in faith. And also, it makes us more like Jesus, and we can appreciate Jesus more as we go through some of the experiences that he did. 
And it's a testimony to unbelievers. And it actually will draw some people to the Lord when they see Christians standing firm for their faith. And so those are some blessings that happen in this, um, in this life. But most of the blessings that are mentioned in the Bible are focusing on eternity. And I've listed them here in our verse, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we have to remember that we are part of a kingdom that's not of this world and we don't need to worry about the kingdoms of this world. They're all going to fade away. But we are a part of the best kingdom and that promise is eternal and so we can rest in that blessing that we are a part of God's kingdom and that the spirit of God and glory rests upon us that means when you face persecution I mean God and his angels are cheering you on I mean they are excited for you to see you stand up for your faith in the midst of persecution and that glory Glory is actually upon you through the Holy Spirit. And your reward in heaven is great. I don't, I don't have details about what all is involved in rewards in heaven, but there are different, different types, and, uh, types of rewards in heaven. And those who are persecuted and endure like the prophets of old, will surely see special rewards in heaven. And those rewards last forever. We work so hard for temporary rewards in this life, but I have to remind myself often about what kind of rewards could I be earning in heaven if I just take a stand here, or if I just do the hard thing instead of the easy thing and try to focus on the rewards in heaven, not the rewards in this life. So with that, let's pray, and then we'll have one more song. Lord, I thank you for your promises of blessings when we are persecuted, that we can be assured that we are part of your kingdom, and that your spirit and your glory rests upon us, and that you are cheering us on in heaven, and that there will be great rewards when we meet you for standing firm in our faith under persecution. I pray, Lord... For each one here, if they are facing any kind of persecution from neighbors, friends, family, work, or on social media, whatever it might be, I pray that you would give them strength to persevere. And I also pray, Lord, for those brothers and sisters around the world who are facing severe persecution and torture, imprisonment, and even death. Pray, Lord that your spirit would be with them, that you would strengthen them, that you would reveal yourself to them in miraculous ways, that you would free many of them from prison, and that you would use them, give them boldness to share the good news even while they're in prison and to see much fruit from their experiences. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have one more song. This is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And it, it sounds, sounds kind of, uh, you know, like a military song, but really keep in mind that he's talking about standing up against the, the evil one and the persecutors, okay?
And now if you could join in singing the doxology. Share the blessing again from the song we sang. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children's children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you and all around you and within you. May he be with you in the morning and the evening, in the coming and going, in your weeping and your rejoicing, for he is for you. Amen. So go forth. He is for you.